Welcome to the 119th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with John Wukovitz, author of the nonfiction book For Crew and Country, the inspirational true story of bravery and sacrifice aboard the USS Samuel B. Roberts. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is John Wukovitz, the author of For Crew and Country, the inspirational true story of bravery and sacrifice aboard the USS Samuel B. Roberts. John, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Jeff, thanks for having me on. I appreciate the uh, chance to talk about the book and uh, to meet your audience. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about the Samuel B. Roberts or the Battle of the Leyte Gulf before, can you, uh, I know it's a pretty big topic, but can you quickly describe the battle and the part that the USS Samuel B. Roberts played in the battle? Sure. It, um, in, it, it was in October of 1944, and the United States was returning to the Philippines to uh, retake it from the Japanese. You know, in 1942, MacArthur had been forced to leave the Philippines, and he made his famous pledge, I shall return. Well, this was MacArthur returning. While well, his forces on land were trying to advance, the U.S. Navy posted at different places along the eastern coastline of the Philippines. Their job was to keep the Japanese Navy off MacArthur's backs. Most of the big guns, big ships and all, were with Admiral Halsey. He had aircraft carriers, battleships, and cruisers. But there were also a number of other units to provide support. One of them was called Taffy 3. That's the unit the Samuel B. Roberts was in. It was stationed near the San Bernardino Strait, which Admiral Halsey was supposed to guard. Uh, Those ships, the Sammy B. Roberts, and the ships with it were not supposed to fight. They they weren't armed with anything much larger than, well, they had five-inch guns, and uh, their shells would only bounce off Japanese carriers, uh, excuse me, battleships and cruisers. Their role was to look for enemy submarines and to help any downed aviators in the sea, that kind of thing. So they were just there never expecting to be in a surface fight. Now they were involved in when 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 MacArthur's forces landed, the huge naval battle called the Battle of Leyte Gulf took place, and it was basically four parts. The part that Samuel B. Roberts was in was called the Battle of Samar. S A M A R was an island on the eastern side there of the Philippines, and um, uh, the Samuel B. Roberts did its actions at that battle. Right. Right. Um, and can you describe that battle and, 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 you know, the ultimately what happened with the USS Samuel B. Roberts? Well, the, the Japanese had devised an intricate three part plan to, to deal with MacArthur's forces. They wanted to attack Leyte Gulf from the north and the south. Now, one unit was going to go through Surigao Strait in the south. While its second unit, way to the north, comprised of empty aircraft carriers, moved down within range of Halsey's uh, uh, scouts, scouting planes, their job was to lure Admiral Halsey away from his post off the northern entrance to Leyte Gulf, and that was San Bernardino Strait. It worked. Halsey, who was itching to get a crack at Japanese carriers, uh, took the bait and went steaming to the north leaving San Bernardino Strait wide open. The Japanese main part of their fleet came barreling through the unguarded strait, and when they turned south to go to Leyte Gulf, they ran smack into Taffy 3, the unit that the Samuel B. Roberts was in. Now, these ships were not meant to fight, and Admiral Sprague, who was their commander, knew he didn't have much time left, so he took the six escort carriers south 
and told his seven destroyers and destroyer escorts to charge the Japanese fleet. And that led to one of the, what I think is one of the most stirring quotes in certainly United States history, Commander Copeland, the skipper of the Roberts, when he received this order to charge Japanese battleships and cruisers, he knew it was pretty much a sacrificial run, almost like a kid on a tricycle charging at a semi-truck rolling down the interstate. He went on the PA and he said, men, we are about to go into a battle against overwhelming odds from which survival is not to be expected. So they turned and charged and, uh, landed one of their torpedoes in one of the cruisers, but then the Roberts was hammered by Japanese shells and sunk, sending the crew into the water for 50 hours. Right. And, and now which, in, which, which you, which you narrate all of that action in, in the book, which, which I've read and, and, and highly recommend. Um, I, I'm just curious about Halsey, as, as you explained earlier, kind of took off, left his post and, and went after these Japanese ships. Um, what, what, what has been kind of the reaction, you know, after, uh, after this battle and, you know, in present day in terms of Halsey and, and his actions, um, which kind of left this, this, you know, um, group of ships exposed and, and ultimately, you know, the, the Samuel B. Roberts obviously went down. Yeah. Now, now, Halsey always defended his actions in going north. He thought that um, the Taffy units plus Oldendorf, Admiral Oldendorf to the south, could have handled the Japanese. The men of the Samuel B. Roberts, everyone I talked to, blame Halsey. You know, because of him, my shipmates died. Historians today generally criticize Halsey for this action. He should have probably left part of his ships off San Bernardino Strait and taken the rest north to go after the carriers or just stayed where he was supposed to be. Um, so most historians will criticize Halsey for doing that. It was one of the mistakes he made. Now, Halsey was one of the great war heroes. Uh, the first two years of war, if it was not for Admiral Halsey, I, I'm not sure where we would have been in the Pacific. It was it was Halsey who led the charge, and for that he should forever be honored. Uh, but at Leyte Gulf, um, I, I think he was just a little too eager right. to get at those enemy carriers, and he let that cloud his judgment a bit. Sure, sure. Well, when did you first hear about the USS Samuel B. Roberts and start thinking about writing about the ship in the battle? In uh, the early 1990s, actually, I, I was researching my first book, a biography of Admiral Sprague, the guy who commanded Taffy Three, and in doing that, I came across the story of the Samuel B. Roberts, since it was one of Sprague's ships. Well, the more I dug into it, the more impressed I was, and then I met some of the crew and their families and saw that these these guys and their sons and wives and daughters and even grandchildren were a pretty tight-knit group, and that impressed me. And I just thought, you know, one day I'd sort of like to do the story of that ship. Uh, so I, I always had it in the background, um, but other projects kept coming along that I was working on. And it wasn't until a few years ago that I decided, okay, it's time to write this story. Right. Now, fortunately, all through those years, I had been interviewing veterans of the ship, so I had a number of their stories, 32 different veterans. Um, uh, had I waited until now, I would have had far less, obviously. Right. How many of the veterans are still alive from the ship? Uh, nine that uh, we know of. There's a couple guys that uh, uh, some of the officers are not, the officers of the Survivors Association uh, are not sure of, but nine that we know of. Um, and of those, probably three or four are in fairly poor shape, and the rest are doing okay. Yeah. And, and you know, as you research the, the history of the, the battle and the, the USS Samuel B. Roberts, was there anything in that research or about the battle itself that surprised you? The, I suppose the fact that not too many people know about what they did. Uh, their actions 
off Samar are far overshadowed by Halsey's actions and by Oldendorf's to the south, where they pretty much crossed the T and just wiped out the Japanese force that approached from that area. MacArthur was there, and, you know, whenever MacArthur enters the scene, uh, everyone else takes sort of a second, uh, you know, <laughs> secondary role. Right. So it was very few people know about this. I mean, Jim Hornfisher's wonderful book, uh, Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors, certainly brought the battle to light. Um, and uh, my book is the same battle, but focuses on the one ship. So I was still surprised at just how many people knew nothing about this. And uh, or knew nothing of someone like a kid named Charles Natter and the sacrifices he made uh, aboard that ship. And so I was happy to be able to do this and maybe uh, correct some of that. Sure. So why don't you tell us about Natter and, and what he did? Okay, Charles Natter was a kid just out of high school. He went to, to um, Atlantic City High School in New Jersey. In the summers, he was a lifeguard at the beaches there. Well, after he graduated from high school, he went right into the Navy. And then before you know it, he was in the, involved in the battle at Late A Gulf. When the ship was sinking, Natter had been wounded twice during the action. Commander Copeland ordered everyone to abandon ship. Natter refused to do so or, or declined not to until every other wounded man was off the ship. Then he left. Then when he was in the raft, life, he was in one of the two life rafts that made it into the, the sea. He spotted about 10 or 12 of his shipmates maybe 50 yards away in the ocean water, just holding on to thin wooden planking. And he thought, you know, that, that's, they're not going to last long there. Uh, and so he made the decision to get out of the life raft and swim the 50 yards out to the planking get one man and swim back with him, then turn around and go back a second time and a third, all of this through shark-infested waters. Now, while swimming 50 yards in a swimming pool is tough enough, but the water is flat, calm there. Imagine in the ocean swells and the salt water slapping into your face and mouth and eyes, and he's wounded twice from the action. I mean, this kid was incredible. Well, he had brought back six or eight of the guys when he, he rested at the planking and his good friend, Tom Azura was right next to him. And they were talking when a shark took Tom Azura away. And then a minute or so later, another shark took Charles Natter to his death. And I so badly wanted to bring his story to light, but I, I couldn't make him a major character only knowing what I just told you there. I had to find out more. So I looked for family. Uh, his mom, dad, brother, and sister had passed away, but I found a niece of his in Massachusetts. When I called her, I asked her if she knew what her Uncle Charles had done, and she said, well, no, we just know he died in World War II. That's all she knew. Mm -hmm. So I told her what I just related to you, and she was astounded. You know, when my Uncle Charlie did that. And uh, so she said, let me check with family members. Well, a couple weeks later, she called me back with almost literally one of these stories. Guess what we found in the attic? <laughs> it was five or six boxes of letters that this kid had written to family and photos and documents and all kinds of stuff. So happily, I was able to make him one of the main characters of the book. That's great. Um, I know that you said that you had, uh, I think you said you interviewed 32 of the, the, um, veterans who survived the, the Samuel B. Roberts. Yes. Um, I, I'm curious what, you know, what was their reaction or what did they recount for you? Their, their reaction, you know, as you said, that, that announcement that, you know, uh, stood out for you in terms of U.S. military history of, you know, we're, we're, yeah. We've been we've been ordered to attack these ships and we're uh, probably not going to survive. I mean that that's that's pretty. I mean it's not a movie; it's real life. I mean I wonder what their reaction yeah. was. Yeah, it ranks right up there with you know don't fire till you see the whites of their eyes and that kind of thing. Uh, their reaction, they'd say, well, John, when I heard Commander Copeland say those words, a chill went up and down my spine, or. I looked down at the deck just thinking, 
well, this is it. I won't see my family. And then they all said, then we got to our tasks. We had an order to do, and we had to carry it out. So it was one of, it was that basic kind of reaction, initial shock. And, uh, you know, you got to deal with it. And, and then in a few seconds, it's all right, let's get to our duty and get, you know, on our posts and just do it. Gotcha. Um, do you, you, you had said earlier that, you know, a lot of people weren't aware of the, of the, um, of the Samuel B. Roberts. Uh, do you think that, that many sailors or commanders today are, are aware of the, the history of the, the, the battle of Leyte and, and, and the fate of the Samuel B. Roberts? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yes, they are. The Navy has made sure that their men know of the Samuel B. Roberts. Now, I'm not saying every sailor and, and you know, all that. Uh, but if you go to the Naval Academy, they certainly know. I, I went to the Naval Academy once with a group of the Samuel B. Roberts survivors, and they were feasted at a, a luncheon with the uh, midshipmen there. Uh, so they know about it. The um, secretary of the Navy under President Reagan, his name was John Lehman, said if it was up to him, we'd always have a ship named the Samuel B. Roberts. And um, and so four ships were named after the Samuel B. Roberts or members of the crew uh, from the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's certainly been uh, remembered. In San Diego Harbor, there's a beautiful memorial to Taffy 3, right next to the aircraft carrier Midway, an escort carrier from World War II. Right. And uh, that, that honors Admiral Sprague and the 13 ships. So people in the military, the Navy especially, certainly know the Samuel B. Roberts. The general public does not. If you mention the ship was sunk and they went into the water and faced sharks for 50 hours, people will say, oh, the USS Indianapolis. They will never say the same would be Roberts. Right. And, and justify the Indianapolis deserves the the, the notice and, and, and attention, obviously. Sure. But that's pretty much the one they remember. Um, and this one was, the, you know, the little ship here. The, the, the destroyer escort's just a football field long, which to some people sounds large, but in Navy terms it's not. And here they turned and attacked Japanese ships that could wipe them out of the water in no time at all. Right. And so I thought, you know, this, this ship, uh, any ship that was in that action deserves some uh, acclaim. And uh, hopefully the book here will give them some attention. Sure. And and since the book has been published, have you gotten any feedback from the survivors who, who have read it? Yeah, the um, gotten feedback from survivors and the public, um, much more so than my previous books. The the survivors are very happy with it. Um, the they said, John, it, the way you wrote it, it sounds real. Uh, you Navy life aboard a ship, a destroyer escort, was realistically portrayed. The the public uh, seems to be drawn to this sense of sacrifice that this crew had and uh, have remarked in almost daily emails I receive, you know, this book should be mandatory reading for every American or in every school or uh, they should make a movie out of it or are any of these guys alive that I can write a letter to and thank, that kind of stuff. So it's been very heartwarming to receive that reaction. That's great. What well, what was the research and writing process like for you for, for this book? I generally take two years to do a book. Uh, Two-thirds of that time is the research and one-third writing. The, um, I, I read every secondary account of the Sammy B. Roberts and its actions, you know, including Jim Horn Fisher's Last Stand of the Tim Kid Sailors. But once I read all those, then I go to the archives and get all the official records from the Navy. Uh, the uh, war diaries and uh, logs and uh, everything, you know, action reports. And after I have all that, then I begin interviewing everybody I can find and supplement the basic foundation story that I got from other books and action reports. I, I fill that in with the uh, human stories from uh, these veterans. So it's sort of like a three or four step process for me to gather all the material. <clears throat> That's why my bibliographies uh, for my books are, are quite lengthy, because I, I do tend to um, 
research very heavily. Gotcha. I think that's important to get the story right. Well, I know you've written many books about about World War II. What, what was the process like for you when you wrote your first book? Were, were you a journalist before that, or how, how did you get into writing these these historical books about World War II? Yeah, I'd, I'd always been a fan of World War II books, going back to my grade school days, actually, when I read a book about the Battle of the Coral Sea, and that hooked me. I, I wanted to read more. And so I always, in the back of my mind, sort of had this idea, you know, wouldn't it be neat to write a book one day? But, you know, life was there, and I I got involved in my teaching. I was a junior high teacher for 30 years here in Trenton, Michigan, which is a little south of Detroit. And um, it was partly because of my classroom work that I decided to give it a crack. I, I was real big in the classroom with my eighth graders in telling them, Go after your dream. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. You know, and I'd show them inspirational movies. I had posters all over the place. And one day I was telling them to chase their dreams when I thought, you know, Wukovitz, you would love to write a book and you've never done one thing to do it. (laughs) And so that's what got me started. I thought, you know, I better take my own advice here uh, that I'm giving out to my students. And so I did. I, I my first published article was in a local newspaper. And I was very proud of it. Uh, That was in 1983. And then I moved into magazines like uh, World War II History and Golf. I love golf, so I wrote a bunch of golf articles. And then I got into World War II books with that Admiral Sprague book, in part because of Tom Buell, B-U-E-L-L, who Mm -hmm. wrote biographies of Spruance and King. Wonderful man. He's deceased now. My writing mentor. Uh, when I got started, I I knew I was behind a little bit because I was, I don't know, 35 years old or whatever. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to write a bunch of historians and ask them for advice. So I did. I sent 40 or so letters out to different. This is in the day before email. And all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I sent, you know, actual letters with stamps and all that. And uh, and I asked them, hey, you know, what advice would you give me? And if, if you need me, any research done, you know, I'll be happy to. Well, over half of them responded with some very beautiful words, you know, uh, John Toland and William Shirer and um, uh, Barbara Tuckman got some wonderful responses. Well, That's Tom cool. Buells was nice, and he also asked me to do some research for him because he's originally from Michigan, and one of his relatives used to be a member of the state House of Representatives. So I went to East Lansing, the, the capital of Michigan, and um, did some research for him. He liked it. And as a result, he said, okay, I'll help you with contacts and writing books. And one of those contacts led into the uh, biography of Admiral Sprague. And that's how all that came about. (laughs) Then I teamed up with an agent for um, the rest of the books. Um, Admiral Sprague is with Naval Institute Press, Mm -hmm. a a great publisher. I love them. They're on the grounds of the Naval Academy. Um, the major publishers like St. Martin's Press or Penguin or whatever, you have to have an agent. So I got an agent, and uh, uh, that's who I work with for most of my stuff now. That's great. Well, um, given your 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 you know experience thus far in in writing the these well researched uh, nonfiction books about World War II, what what advice would you have for someone who maybe like you um, were and and wanting to to you know write especially nonfiction and in, in, in historical accounts, what what kind of advice would you give them? Well, find out which area you you have a passion for, like mine was World War II, mm-hmm. and if it's World War II, is it the European theater or the Pacific theater? Uh, I had to have that passion. Once you have that, then you start writing get written, get published somewhere, because you can't just jump into a book with nothing else in your resume. I mean, I suppose it's happened somewhere along the way. I'm not saying it's impossible, sure. but editors like to see some kind of a list in your resume. And so that first little article I did for the local newspaper, I could put that on in those articles, because I did some for the Detroit News and Detroit Free Press, those articles made me more attractive to the magazine editors 
And those uh, magazine articles made me more attractive to the book publishers. So start writing and um, write every day. When I was at Notre Dame as an undergraduate student, someone asked our writing professor, how do you become a writer? And he said, no, no, again, this is in the days before computers. Right. And he said, well, sit down at your desk, start typing, and 10 years later, maybe you're a writer. So in other words, just work at it every day. And that's it. That's how I, uh, how I happened to work into being the writer that I am now with these books. Gotcha. Well, well, I know that that um, several times you've mentioned in this interview the 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 last stand of the tin can sailors, and I'm sure you're very widely read in terms of uh, World War II history. Are there any uh, are there any books that you would recommend to listeners who may be interested in learning more about both the, the Pacific and European uh, theaters of World War II that you would recommend? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I, I have some favorite books that I talk about quite a lot. And um, Tom Buell's books are certainly there. Obviously, if I'm a little biased, possibly, but uh, he wrote in a style that was just so beautiful. So his biography of Admiral Spruance, especially, is, is unbelievable. Um, Bill Malden's book, Up Front, he was that cartoonist, famous cartoonist in the European theater. But his book gives such a great description of what it was like over there. Plus his cartoons, Willie and Joe were the two main characters of his cartoons, mm -hmm. uh, that he, he brought the war home for what it was like for the average infantryman. A, a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, another is John Dower's War Without Mercy, about the role of uh, prejudice in the Pacific War. Um, another, the best memoir to come out of the war, in my opinion, is Eugene Sledge's book, with the Marines at uh, Okinawa. Uh, I think it's with the Marines at Iwo Jima and Okinawa. I'm not sure the exact title, but right. Eugene Sledge, mm -hmm. a wonderful, wonderful book. And there's so many. I'm, I know I'm forgetting some. I, I really love reading some of the books that were written and published during the war, right. some of those books about the war. They're, they're, they're very powerful in their own way. A guy named Robert Casey wrote a book called Torpedo Junction in 1942. Incredible. If you want to know what the feel was like at the time in the Pacific, that's the book to read for sure. Interesting. So those are some. I yep, mentioned yep, so that, many. That, that's great. So so what what are you working on next? Do you know what your next book will be about? Yeah, just uh, as a matter of fact, a half hour ago, I emailed my proposal into my agent on uh, the USS Laffey, a, a destroyer that was... Um, the most kamikaze ship in the war, I'll call it. I may have made up a word there in kamikaze, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but it, in 80 minutes of action off Okinawa, it was attacked by 22 kamikazes, and it survived. Uh, eight of them hit the ship, uh, and uh, some of them splashed so closely that they did damage to the ship. So it's quite an, uh, quite an amazing feat that they did that one day. Plus, the ship was also involved uh, at D-Day off Normandy uh, before it went over to the Pacific. It was involved in the Philippines, Iwo Jima, and then, of course, Okinawa. So I'm, I'm telling their story, um, assuming the publisher accepts the proposal, sure, that sure. is. <laughs> nothing's written in stone. But it's looking sure. pretty decent, I think. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with John Wukovitz. He's the author of the new book, The Historical Account of the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And the name of the book is For Crew and Country. The book is available in bookstores now. John, thanks for doing this interview. Yeah, it's at any Costco also throughout the country. Uh, they bought a bunch of them, so you can get them at Costco. But, That's hey, Jeff, thanks. You asked some wonderful questions. You're, you're a good interviewer. Thank you. Thank you.